morning, everyone. Welcome to our service this morning. It's wonderful to have you all here. It's another beautiful day in the neighborhood. Um, notice that a lot of the local farmers markets have opened up and uh, all the garden produce is there for us to enjoy and uh, to partake in. And I know a lot of you have planted your own gardens this season. And uh, I hear that the zucchini is quite plentiful. So be prepared, everyone. You might have zucchini coming your way. And if you're looking for some zucchini recipes, give me a shout because I've got uh, main course and dessert uh, recipes that you can use with zucchini. Zucchini brownies are actually quite good. Who would have thought, right? Anyway, but in the in the mode of uh, gardening and everything else like that, I thought it'd be nice to uh, to sing a, an old favorite. It's uh, it was copyrighted back in 1912, so it goes back a little bit. It's uh, probably uh, my my grandma Powell's uh, most favorite hymn, and I know it's a, a favorite in our family as well. It's entitled "In the Garden." I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear. The Son of God discloses, and He walks with me, and He talks with me, and He tells me I am His own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever He speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me i am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known i stay in the garden with him though the night around me be falling but he bids me go through the voice of woe his voice to me is calling and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me i am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known. Yes, it is another lovely morning. And again, welcome to everyone who's joining in with us today. Uh, another shout out to the Gibsons, uh, Michael and Nancy, thanks again for your musical selections for today. They're absolutely beautiful. Um, if you haven't had a chance to listen to them yet, I suggest after our service this morning, you uh, traipse over to the video section of the Bethune Facebook page and, and check out their musical offerings for today. Uh, Sprocket seems to be really enjoying herself this morning on the chair. She's sound asleep and snoring. So if you hear some rumblings in the background, that's what's going on. It's just Sprocket. <laughs> well, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. For thousands of years, Indigenous people have walked on this land in their own country. The relationship with 
with the land is at the center of their lives. We acknowledge the Chippewa, Iroquois, and Algonquin people, past, present, and their emerging leaders, for their stewardship of this land throughout the ages. And may we promise and challenge ourselves to make truth and reconciliation real in our community of faith and here in our daily life. Well, as we gather to worship, we thank you, God. We thank you for the many blessings of our lives. And we raise our voices in praise, remembering your wonderful works in our lives. In line with our ancestors in faith, with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, we praise you for the opportunities that we have known, the work we are able to get, for the doors that are open to us, and for the privileges in life. For all the ways you have been our provider and defender, we praise you. Be with us as we worship this day and hear our voices lifted in praise. Hear us, see us, be with us, and bless us as we worship and in our life. Well, let us pray. Loving God, we praise you for the opportunity to gather and worship. Open our hearts as we bring ourselves before you in humble desire to follow your ways and know your wisdom. Open our eyes and help us see our lives, how our lives impact others and this created world. Open our ears and help us to hear the voices of those who have been silenced for far too long. Open our minds and help us to understand our impact of the world and our more rightful place in it. Show us your glory and guide us and guide our thoughts and reflections as we worship and as we pray together saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. When we turn now to our scripture reading for today, may we open ourselves to the seeds of wisdom that lie dormant in this reading, and may our minds be fertile soil in which it may grow strong and true. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Genesis. We're continuing through the story of, of Jacob. It's Genesis 29, uh, chapter 29, verses 15 through 28. Laban said to Jacob, you shouldn't work for me for nothing just because you are my relative. How much pay do you want? Laban had two daughters. The older was named Leah and the younger Rachel. Leah had lovely eyes, but Rachel was shapely and beautiful. Jacob was in love with Rachel. So he said, I will work seven years for you if you will let me marry Rachel. Laban answered, I would rather give her to you than anyone else. Stay here with me. Jacob worked seven years so that he could have Rachel and the time seemed like only a few days to him because he loved her so. Then Jacob said to Laban, the time is up. Let me marry your daughter. So Laban gave a wedding feast and invited everyone. But that night instead of Rachel, he took Leah to Jacob and Jacob had intercourse with her. Laban gave his slave woman, Siblar, to his daughter Leah as her maid. Not until the next morning did Jacob discover that it was Leah. He went to Laban and said, why did you do this to me? I worked to get Rachel. Why have you tricked me? Laban answered, it is not the custom here to give the youngest daughter in marriage before the older. Wait until the week's marriage celebrations are over and I will give you Rachel if you will work for me another seven years. Jacob agreed, and when the week of marriage celebrations was over, the man gave him the daughter, Rachel, as his wife. Well, may the Spirit bless us with wisdom and wonder as we ponder the meaning of these words for our lives. Well, for our young at heart today, here is our, uh, our story. It's Jacob meets Rachel. Jacob was walking. He walked over the hills. He walked over the mountains. He walked through the rivers. Jacob was happy. Jacob knew God cared for him and loved him. Jacob was looking for his uncle Laban's house, and he asked some shepherds along the way who were tending their sheep, 
He said, do you happen to know where my uncle lives? My uncle Laban lives. Oh yes, we know your uncle, said the shepherd. His daughter Rachel will be coming soon to get some water for her sheep. So Jacob sat down and waited. And soon Rachel came. Rachel's sheep were very thirsty. But Rachel needed help moving the big flat stone that covered the well. Please help me, Rachel said to Jacob. So Jacob helped push the stone off the top of the well. And Jacob gave a drink of water to all of Rachel's sheep. Thank you, said Rachel. I haven't seen you before. Who are you? I'm Jacob, your cousin, said Jacob. Jacob was glad to see her, and Rachel was glad to see Jacob too, and she ran to tell her father. Rachel's father, Laban, was happy to see Jacob. Jacob, you are welcome in my house, Uncle Laban said. You just come and stay with us. And that is how Jacob met Rachel. And one day, a long time after, Jacob married Rachel. Well, let us pray. You, who, you whose voice thunders into the silence with the word of creative love, give us courage, resilience, and trust to know that silence need never be sub submission or acceptance of brokenness in our lives and in the, our world. May our actions be grounded in the power of the spirit at work, bringing healing into all of creation. Amen. Well, silence in the face of injustice is often portrayed as consent, implicit acceptance, weakness grounded in fear. And this week's scripture passages remind us that silence can be a form of powerful resistance and subversion of imperial or patriarchal norms when the silence is grounded in the redemptive work of God's spirit. Have you ever felt like you don't have a voice. Have you ever felt like you were treated as a commodity? Well, reading through our scripture from today, you have to ponder whether or not the women in this story have any reason to expect they will have any ability to influence their own future. And on the flip side, on the flip side of that coin, the men in this story have every reason to expect that their future, the future that they can anticipate, will be very much the future that exists for them now. The exiles in Babylon, for whom this scripture uh, from Genesis, this Genesis story was first put together, would have no problem recognizing their lives in the silence of Rachel and Leah, who in today's text are traded, treated and traded as a mere commodity by their father, Laban. But you see, as we, as we move through the story, we find that the women are really just biding their time. Silence in the face of injustice is sometimes the prudent and only option. Rebecca and Leah had little power or authority in a patriarchal world to resist the demands the, the, the dictates of their father, Laban, no matter how unjust. So then I'm sure it came as no surprise to Rachel and Leah that Laban would swap out Leah for Rachel on Rachel's wedding night for Laban to gain the upper hand, the advantage with Jacob. But we soon come to find that with Leah and Rachel, silence is not the same as acceptance. The two sisters remain free to act when the time feels right. And like their mother, Rebecca, they too knew that they too could manipulate that power of domination and form their own act of resistance. And as we read through the scriptures, they tell us that Leah and Rachel come together to persuade Jacob to leave their father behind. And again, for the exiles in Babylon, it comes as a strong word of hope that the God of creation and liberation is present and at work among those and through those who appear to be without a voice. The dictionary definition of subversion is a systematic attempt to overthrow or undermine a system or an effort or an individual 
or a whole nation by persons working from within. Or we might say, <laughs> subversion is when the world seems turned upside down. And so when we listen, when we actually take the time to listen, to hear, by just being silent, we're going against the norm and turning our world upside down. It seems in our world today, silence is really not all that uh, valued. And it's not really widely developed. And at times it is knocked out by, uh, it's just knocked out of those for whom it comes naturally. The ability to holding silent, to sitting back, to observe carefully and listen intently is a rare skill, but it's one that is worth developing. I don't know if any of you have ever watched Oprah. I'm sure you all have, but Oprah is well known for her aha moments. Those epiphanies are moments that spark brilliant, unexpected solutions. And they tend to show up when we are able to be quiet and to quiet our mind. When we are able to con consciously silence our minds long enough for us to remember just what is important. And then we are able to focus on those things. We live in a world where so many of us are swamped with everything there is to do. So I believe that a silent pause is vital for real effectiveness. And when we turn off all that noise, that still quiet voice has a chance to say, here I am. Those quiet pauses throughout our day can connect us. They can ease our minds and put us in touch with ourselves. In fact, even experts agree that we need to choose to make silence a part of our life. There's a book entitled, Just Sit. A meditation guide for people who know they should, but don't. Great title, huh? Well, this book encourages people to take time each day for reflection. Silence isn't just about the absence of noise. It's about getting yourself to slow down. We know the world would be a kinder place if we could all just slow down, to sit each day and I'm sure everyone on this planet could benefit from some meditation for some quiet time. It helps us live consciously. And according to psychologists and philosophers alike, silence can wake us up and provide meaningful answers in our life. Silence can give us a gentle nudge to let us know if something doesn't feel right by putting us in touch with our bodies and our emotions. Psychological benefits of experiencing silence, even when it makes us uncomfortable, can mean more purposeful living. Silence can increase self-awareness, self-compassion, and improve decision-making skills with improved mental clarity. So you see, we can use it to become even more mindful and self and self-compassion. Mindfulness is the first step in emotional healing. It's being able to turn toward and acknowledge our difficult thoughts and feelings with a spirit of openness and curiosity. Self-compassion involves responding to those difficult thoughts and feelings with kindness, sympathy, and understanding so that we soothe and comfort ourselves when we're hurting. Research has shown that self-compassion greatly enhances emotional well-being. It boosts happiness, reduces anxiety and depression, and can even maintain healthy lifestyle habits such as diet and exercise. Being both mindful and compassionate leads to greater ease and well-being in our daily lives. Silence can even enhance conversation. You see, by choosing silence, you will naturally listen more and others have the opportunity to share more, enhancing our relationship. Silence can be that space between a feeling and a response. Take a silent pause 
and choose your response calmly and wisely. It's tough at first, but it gets better with practice. If silence is something you rarely get or even fear, fear just a little, lean toward activities that can help you practice. A good one for me is my yoga class. It allows me that time to get inside my head, to get inside me. And at the beginning, at the end, in Shavasana, that quiet time, that time of rest, you can slow down that monkey mind and just concentrate on moving inward into yourself. But then there's other things besides yoga. I know in Muskoka and, and where I am, we have that opportunity to sit out and listen to the birds and all that nature brings to us. But if you don't have that opportunity, there's all kinds of nature CDs that you can get your hands on. Or how about when you're driving, you drive with the radio off. And when you go to bed, use the silence to get calm or perhaps even listen to a CD of nature music then. Or an added bonus, if it's raining, just listen to that rain on the roof. Let silence help you wander through happy memories or list what you're grateful for in your life right now. Hey, you can even buy some noise canceling headphones if it comes to that. But you could really just ask your family to support you in a 15 minute break for silence each day. It's been said that silence is a source of great strength. Taking the time for silence sends your message, yourself the message that you are worth hearing. Honor your life by practicing silence regularly. Well, we turn now to our minute for mission this morning. It's in, entitled Widening the Welcome. The United Church of Christ USA is a full communion partner of the United Church of Canada. Every few years, it organizes a national conference called Widening the Welcome, or WTW. And it's jointly hosted by Disabilities Ministries and Mental Health Network. The conference is one way for the church to become more acceptable, accessible, sorry. The event is packed with speakers, worship, workshops, and networking opportunities. For the WTW conference in November of 2018, the United Church of Canada sent a small delegation of people with disabilities and their allies. They were all committed to the United Church's desire to become a more open, accessible, and barrier-free church where people with disabilities can fully participate in all areas of the church's life. The United Church of Canada offered financial support for people to attend this conference which was possible through mission and service. Some delegates found the conference an amazing learning experience and came back from it transformed and even more passionate about disability ministry. One of them said, I came back with strong enthusiasm to share this knowledge with my church and promote accessibility in the United Church of Canada. Moved by the conference, other delegates have created and led worship and offered educational sessions in their own ministry context. Through mission and service, people of the United Church of Canada have been inspired to make the church even more open, accessible, and barrier-free for all. If mission and service is already a regular part of your life of faith, thank you so much. If you have not given, please join me in making mission and service giving a regular part of your life of faith. For you see, loving our neighbor is at the heart of our mission and service. For those of you on par, we thank you for your donations to Knox and Bethune. For those of you who are just watching in and may feel the, feel the spirit move you to donate to either of our congregations, please get in touch with me and I will be happy to give you the, the, uh, the, the, comp, the connection for our treasurer. And also on the Bethune page, there's also a donation button. So feel free to uh, use that as well. But for all the donations that have been brought to our church, you offer this prayer of thanks. Let us pray. We dedicate this offering to all who have been used, silenced, unseen, and forgotten. 
Bless it, we pray, with the yeast to make spirits rise. Transform it into the bread of life for the hungry of this world and make it shine like the jewels of glory discovered by those who need your strength the most. Amen. We move now to our prayers of the people. And if there is some that for whom you would like to have prayers said, please let me know and I will add them to my own personal prayer list. So let us pray together. Loving God, help us to hear the voices of others in our world and help us to notice and care. Holy Creator, give us the strength to speak up and tell our stories and show us the places in this world where our realities can be held as true and holy and valuable. Gracious Provider, we know that you have given us the diversity of experience from which to learn and grow. We thank you, beloved Savior, for walking this journey with us and giving us companions in justice and love. Show us how to be a people united and in true communion with each other. For all who feel silenced, we lift our voices in compassion. For all who feel treated like property, we pray your dignity and renewal. For all who have suffered the indignities of patriarchy and oppressions of power mongering, we pray for healing and wholeness. May we be one and may we be true in our pursuits of your ways. Amen. Well, my friends, let us go out into the world and invite all voices to be heard. Let us go into the world and listen closely to all stories. Let us go into the world transformed by the blessing in God's holy design. Let us go into the world made new. Amen. Well, my friends, be strong, be positive, be healthy, be a blessing, be a friend. Wear a mask. And to quote Anne Frank, be kind and have courage. Enjoy the rest of this beautiful day and may you find silence within this week. And may you find yourself a blessing upon those who need your love and strength and guidance the most. Take care, my friends. God bless.